Oh God, we need you. We thank you for the ways our hearts have been prepared already. We praise you for your kindness in giving us your word. And we ask now for your Holy Spirit's help to understand that we might know you, that we might love you, that we might worship you, all for your glory, the glory of a Father and a Holy Spirit and a Son who have worked together to accomplish our salvation, whom we desperately need, even in these moments. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You probably remember receiving it on your birthday or maybe on Christmas morning. That toy, that gizmo, the gadget, you know, the one you really, really wanted. It had lights and sounds and it did stuff. And when the wrapping paper was successfully discarded, you begin to pry open the cardboard box and then wrestle away those twisty ties that hold all of the accessories in place. And then, of course, not to be bothered with the instructions sheet, you hustle through the some assembly required phase, and then remembering your manners, you look up at the eyes of the ones who gave you this treasure, and you mumble through a little thank you. And then, how do I turn it on? rolling the gadget over and over until you find that glorious switch on. Nothing. Nothing happens. No lights. No sounds. No activities that were promised. What's wrong with this thing? You look at the instruction sheet and then you look back at the cardboard box and both of them confirm the same devastating reality. Batteries not included. Life itself is like that, full of promises of joy and blessing, so many good gifts and wonderful things to explore and see and experience, and yet something very important is missing. You see, there is a problem with life. We're going to look at that problem this morning in our Bibles, from the pen of Solomon in his great sermon called Ecclesiastes, which he penned at the end of his life, after his grand experiment with life, in his repentance, he puts pen to page and records for us what we need to know about how to navigate life in a fallen world, in a broken world, in a sin-affected world, in a God-cursed world. In Ecclesiastes 6, we will find many of the themes we've seen already in this great sermon, sort of put all together in the middle of the book, the problem of life. Let's read together Ecclesiastes chapter 6. God speaks through Solomon and says this, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God has not empowered him to eat from them. For a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things, he does not even have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. For it comes in futility and goes into obscurity, and its name is covered in obscurity. It never sees the sun, and it never knows anything. It is better off than he. And even if that man lives a thousand years twice and does not enjoy good, do not all go to one place. All a man's labor is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living? 
What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and striving after wind. Whatever exists has already been named, and it is known what man is, for he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he. For there are many words which increase futility. What then is the advantage to a man? For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime, during the few years of his futile life? He will spend them like a shadow. For who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? Something is wrong. Something is desperately wrong with life. And we all experience it. As Solomon begins his message here in chapter 6 with this remarkable statement, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is prevalent among men. And the evil he describes here is not some moral calamity, but a great, big, bad. Something just bad. Something that's hard to take. And he says this is prevalent, that is, it dominates the human condition. Solomon is unfolding the problem of life in this whole book, and here in chapter 6, he is going to focus on seven facets of the problem of earthly existence. Something is wrong with this life, and the, the first facet of that great big wrong is the problem with cash and fame. The problem with cash and fame. He describes it in verse 2. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that his soul lacks nothing of all that he desires. Yet God has not empowered him to eat from them for a foreigner enjoys them. This is vanity and a severe affliction. Notice first of all that this hypothetical man that Solomon describes is the beneficiary of God's good gifts. God is the giver in verse 2, and notice what he gives. Riches, wealth, honor, everything the man desires. Uh, Who could ask for anything more, right? Who's wanted anything more under the sun than what this man has been given by God? All of these blessings. But notice what the man does not have. Power to eat from them. And the idea of eating from them is the idea of enjoying them. God has given the man all of the blessings, but the man is not blessed by them. He he lacks the fundamental thing that's required for the enjoyment of the stuff. That's the power to enjoy the stuff. This is in contrast to what we looked at last week in chapter 5, verse 19. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift from God. Notice, if a man is to enjoy the great and glorious and wonderful and desirable gifts that God gives, then God must also give the ability to enjoy them. Here in chapter 6, verse 2, all the blessings are there but no enjoyment. And what's worse for this hypothetical man is someone else gets to enjoy his blessings. One commentator wrote, The people most often envied are frequently the most miserable people on the face of the earth. And the reason for that is under the sun things do not have the power to guarantee their own enjoyment. History is replete with the tales of the rich and the famous who had access to everything that everybody else wants but whose lives ended in misery. At 46 years old, actor Philip Seymour Hoffman had what most people desire. Fame, money, possessions, family. And in 2014, he ended his life with an overdose of heroin. His life and his death were another tragedy in a long line of celebrity self-destructions. What would bring a man to this point? Some might blame the drug or the drug dealer. But the desire for such a destructive escape reveals a problem deeper than drug addiction. Philip Seymour Hoffman's death is a sobering reminder that something is terribly wrong with the world in which we live. 
A man who has everything that that world can promise, everything that everyone else strives to get, and it is not enough. And Solomon cries out, this is a vanity and a severe affliction. And the word vanity is that Hebrew word you've learned and loved in the book of Ecclesiastes, hevel. It's used 38 times in the book and five times in this chapter alone. It, it means something like vanity or futility or emptiness, something that is fleeting, like a vapor. Elsewhere in Scripture, it's used to describe things that are worthless. It's used to describe idols and idolatry. The base meaning of this word hevel is a breath or a puff of air. It's temporary and insignificant. One author wrote, it's like soap bubbles, delightfully beautiful, multicolored, shimmering globes dancing in the air and gracefully changing their form until, poof, they disappear in a shiny cascade of tiny droplets. Beautiful, but unsubstantial. Delightful, but ephemeral. It's like the steam off the top of a cup of coffee. Or as Rick Holland has said, like the flavor of juicy fruit gum. It's fantastic for about three and a half seconds. And then you need another piece to get rid of the awful taste that's left over. It's like the low clouds that hung around in the valleys in East Tennessee where I went to college. In the morning, every morning, these clouds would hang around in those low valleys. And and just as I would drive down into them expecting to immerse myself in this cool, dark cloud. It it was gone because the sun had come up and made it vanish. The allurement of riches and possessions and fame is intoxicating. But the fulfillment which they promise is elusive. Think about the promise that is behind the lure of wealth. The, The promise is there is not just to have stacks of green and gold. There's a promise behind it, a a promise of happiness, of joy, of fulfillment, or of satisfaction. You must know already that the stuff of this earth cannot fulfill, cannot deliver on what it promises. You may be familiar with the ancient Greek mythology around Tantalus. He was a figure who went to eternal punishment, and that is what he is most famous for. He went to Tartarus, the place of punishment, and forever he was made to stand in a pool of cool, refreshing water beneath a fruit tree with low branches and and the most exquisite fruit. The fruit, however, forever eluded his grasp. When he would reach for it, the branches would be just too high, and when he would stoop down to try to get a cool, refreshing drink of water, the waters would recede. And so forever he was tantalized. Right, that's where we get our English word. It's like a new toy. You just opened this glorious present you've longed for and the batteries are not included. It's like having a table filled every day with the finest cuisine, but having no taste buds with which to enjoy it. Not only is there a problem with fame and honor and wealth, There's also a problem with kids and long life. The kids just looked up, what? There's a problem with me? It's not what you think. Look what Solomon says beginning in verse 3. If a man fathers a hundred children and lives many years, however many they be, but his soul is not satisfied with good things and he does not have a proper burial, then I say, better the miscarriage than he. Children are a blessing. And if one child is a blessing, why not two? Why not 12? Why not 100? It's the more the merrier, right? This is a remarkable hypothetical situation. I mean, I, I hope a man who fathers 100 children is married more than once and hopefully not at the same time. I don't know how that all works, but that's a lot of children to have. And if we're just talking about one wife, oh, we're not going to go down that road. In ancient Near Eastern culture, extensive progeny was seen as a blessing. The fuller the quiver, the the more God had obviously blessed you was the cultural thought. 
And here is a picture of a home filled with the love of many children for their father. But this father is unable to enjoy all of that joy that should be there with so many children. He lives many years. Again, in the ancient Near Eastern world, longevity was seen to be a a blessing from God. And longevity for us seems to be the holy grail of man's enterprise. So much of our medical technology, uh, things like plastic surgery and even cryogenics, you can try to have yourself frozen to, to last just a little bit longer until the medical technology catches up to make you live longer. Long life was prized in the ancient world as well. But notice what happens with this man. His soul is not satisfied. No doubt these are good things. Long life and many children, lots of blessings from God, and yet his soul is not satisfied. And he has no proper burial. This was important in the ancient Near East. It was a symbol of honor and blessing and respect from those around you. Who was this man? Did did he die alone? Was he like the miser we read about last week in chapter 5 who closed out his earthly days in darkness? Who who took his meals by himself? Had his pursuits to, to go after the cash estranged him from his own children? Whatever the case may be, Solomon says, by comparison, there's something better than that. Better never to have experienced life under the sun than to be that man, to have all the things the world would think was great, but not the ability to enjoy them. He compares that to an unborn child. Better to never have entered the futility of this existence than to be given immeasurable blessings and not be blessed by them. Better to have never lived under the sun than to experience what one author says are frustrations, disappointments, and enigmas of this present life. No doubt this is a dark statement. This is a dark statement in the middle of the book of Ecclesiastes and it reflects the futility of life to which Solomon gave full meditation. What's interesting about verses 3 to 5 is that The problem of life isn't limited to selfishness or sinful pursuits, unrefined hedonism. But the problem of life also applies to the best things, the the, the good things, the the purest things, the blessings. This is the family man with many children, and his life is plagued by the same problem. Not only is there a problem with fame and wealth and honor and a problem with kids and long life, thirdly, there is a problem with more. A problem with more. Look at verse 6. Even if that man lives a thousand years twice and does not enjoy good things, do not all go to the same place. Listen, if the things that you've tried in life have proven unsatisfying, maybe you just need more time to keep trying. Maybe you need more of those things. Maybe you need a a longer experimental period to try to find satisfaction under the sun. And Solomon says, no. If a man lives a thousand years, and, and think about the lifespans of human history. The longest ones we know of, Methuselah at 969 and Adam at 930 years. They almost reached that millennia of earthly existence. Solomon says, multiply that by two. Imagine, could that man find happiness? A man can have everything the world offers and have it for a long time and still not see good We might be tempted to think, you know, the problem with that gizmo that I unwrapped on Christmas morning was was that I only had one of them. I mean, if I had two, now now that would be something. Or maybe it would work if I had 10 of them or 20 of them. And the reality is, if you and I had 20 million batteryless gizmos, none of them would work. And all that would happen would be an increased level of frustration and a storage problem, and the work that went into wrestling with all of that plastic packaging and the twisty ties on those 200 million gizmos. Someone in a factory somewhere ties all those things to the cardboard boxes. 
In the end, Solomon says, death equalizes everything under the sun. Look at verse 6. Do not all go to one place. More is not the answer. There's also a problem with food. This comes out in verse 7. Solomon says, all a man's labor is for his mouth, and they, yet the appetite is not satisfied. The appetite churns relentlessly, but sustenance is temporary. How do we say it? Eat to work and work to eat? I need energy to go to work, to get a paycheck, to spend it on food, so that I can have energy to work, to get a paycheck, to spend it on food, for energy, to work, to get paid, to eat, to work, for money, for food, to work, for money, for food, to work. Providing for yourself is this vicious, endless cycle. Hoping for enduring satisfaction in a single meal is a good metaphor for the problem of all of life. No matter how much food I get or no matter how good the food is, I will be hungry again. If only there was a bread that did not perish. If only there was a water that quenched a thirst forever. And we see that same cycle in lots of aspects of life. In order to get a job, you need a resume. To build a resume, you have to get a job. To get a job to build a resume, you have to have transportation. Transportation costs money. <laughs> money comes from working. Uh, these cycles are everywhere. Looking for ultimate meaning in things under the sun is a fruitless hamster wheel of disappointment. Fifthly, there is a problem with wisdom and simplicity. Solomon turns the corner here in verse 8 and says, What advantage does the wise man have over the fool? What advantage does the poor man have knowing how to walk before the living? It begins first with maybe the answer is in wisdom, in philosophy, in learning. Solomon says that the wise man has no advantage over the, pool, over the fool in answering this question. Now Solomon has demonstrated that the wise man has some advantage over the fool. We talked about that earlier in Ecclesiastes. The wise man can see where he's going, that this all terminates in futility. The fool has no idea where it's going. The fool might be driving off a cliff with a blindfold on. The wise man can't change what the vehicle is doing as it careens off the cliff, but at least he can see it coming. Here, in relationship to this question, what advantage is there in the face of the great equalizer of death for the fool, for the wise man? No advantage. They end the same. They can't find the answer to the problem. For reasons we'll see in just a few moments, human understanding, human reasoning, human intellect, human philosophy will never arrive at the answer to this problem. In fact, it cannot it doesn't have the capacity to even ask the right question. Notice the second half of verse 8. The poor man who knows how to walk before the living. This man is different than the wise man. Uh, he has wisdom, but not the blessings that normally go with wisdom. He's impoverished, but he's astute. That is, he knows how to walk before the living. He's, he's sort of figured life out in his way. And, and maybe this is the one who has committed himself to simplified living. He's above the dust and the dazzle of the rat race. He has extricated himself from all of that nonsense. He's gotten off the hamster wheel as he sees it. And maybe that's the answer. The, the simple life, you know, just downsize. Sell all your stuff. Get out of the rat race altogether. Go off the grid. Get away from people. Move to the wilderness and grow some free-range broccoli or whatever. And Solomon knows that that's not the answer. It's not found in some sort of balance or some sort of simplicity. Any such exercise only exacerbates the futility. The simple life can't deliver on what it promises any more than the extravagant life could. The simple man is hunting the same prey as the extravagant man, and it will not be found in simplicity any more than it can be found in extravagance. There is a sixth 
problem with life. It is the problem with desire. Look at verse 9. What the eyes see is better than what the soul desires. This too is futility and a striving after wind. He says literally what the eyes see is better than how the soul wanders around. The soul walking about. Uh, We say this another way, a, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Right? Whatever you have, hold on to that. If you give up what you have in order to hope for what you don't have, well, that's foolishness. The problem here is the problem with the wanderlust in the human heart. It's a failure to be content. And the kind of contentment that a broken world demands is not accessible to human wisdom. It's not attainable by human understanding. It is not available by human power. It must come from somewhere else. There is a wandering desire in the human heart for the unattainable. And I'll try to get the unattainable in this thing for a while. And when I get bored with that, I move on to another thing. And when that doesn't work out, I go on to something else. And the promise of delivery is universal. The billboards, the television commercials, at the store, all of the things out there, they say, happiness is found here. Come by me. The sales pitch may be universal, but the recall notice is not so universal, not quite so loud. One by one, quietly, Alone, maybe when it's too late, people come to the realization that the sales hype was empty. Our eyes were bigger than our stomachs for the things that could never bring satisfaction. And we bought that hype, we got the stuff, then we traded that stuff in for other stuff, and then we sold that stuff to someone else who hadn't tried what we had already tried. And we got more. And hopefully in this life, found out that we had misdiagnosed the problem altogether. Perhaps most don't discover it in this life. By God's grace, Solomon discovered it at the end of his experiment. Before God took him away from this earth. Remember in Ecclesiastes 1-2, he said, all is vanity. Everything is nothing talking about all of life under the sun. He had tried everything there was to try in greater measure than any of us could ever do. So what is the problem with life? What is it that underlies the difficulties with money, with honor, with children, with longevity, with food or work or wisdom or simplicity? What is the fundamental problem of our desires? The problem with life is God, according to Solomon in Ecclesiastes 6. Look at verses 10 to 12. Whatever exists has already been named, and it is known what man is, for he cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he is. For there are many words which increase futility. What then is the advantage to a man? For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? During the few years of his futile life, he will spend them like a shadow. For who can tell him what will be after him under the sun? Verse 10 is a cryptic statement about the sovereignty of God. We call these the divine passives. Something has been named. But the author doesn't tell us who's doing the naming. This is the divine passive. God is the one naming what is described here. To name something is a a recognition of authority over something else. Adam was given the task of naming all of the animals. There is an ownership or a sovereignty or of an ordination in naming something. God is the one who names, verse 10, everything that exists. And God is the one who knows what man is. Man might be confused. 
Man tends to think more highly of himself than he ought. But God knows what man is. Ecclesiastes 6.10 is right smack dab in the middle of the book of Ecclesiastes. It is the center of the book. And it centers on God. It zeroes in on the fundamental problem of life. And God is at the very heart of it. The message here in verse 10 is, don't fight with a sovereign God. Look how Solomon says it in the second half of the verse. Man cannot dispute with him who is stronger than he is. Who's he talking about? He's talking about God. Man is, not in, man is not to get into a wrestling match with his maker. Man is not to begin arguing with God. Do you remember how that went for Job? The God who is sovereign over all things saw fit to allow certain events to come into Job's life. Even at the hand of God's great enemy, Satan himself. And as tragedy after tragedy encroached into Job's existence, one messenger after another, Job's first response was to worship God in humility and trust. And as you read the rest of the book of Job, you find Job beginning to argue with his maker. Get in an arm wrestling match with God over who's right and why should these things have happened to me? And, and while there are sparks of faith and light in what Job says, a lot of the middle section of that book is Job wrestling with God over these things. And the book of Job ends with God manifesting Himself, revealing Himself to Job, finally speaking, and Job's response is, I repent and dust and ashes. I didn't know what I was talking about. And Job's final realization is one he should have clung to by faith throughout. I'm not sure any of us would have fared better than Job did. Solomon's conclusion is the same. In the midst of a broken world, don't get in an argument with your maker. He is sovereign. In fact, we'll discover in the next chapter, chapter 7, verse 13, that God has bent the created order, and no one could straighten it. God has done this on purpose. And while Solomon says in verse 11, there are many words, they only increase Hevel, they increase the futility. Endless volumes of books attempting to explain life's vexing perplexity are a monument to the futility of finding the answer under the sun by human wisdom. And then a series of rhetorical questions that actually aren't rhetorical. He says, who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? It sounds like, well, who knows? Actually, it should be, who is it that knows what is good for a man? God does. If we keep reading the book of Ecclesiastes, that's exactly what Solomon is going to tell us. He's going to answer the question. When he asks, who can tell a man what will be after him under the sun? Well, God does. And Solomon will tell us that as we progress through the book of Ecclesiastes. No one under the sun can tell us these things. But that is the point of the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon is driving us to despair of an under-the-sun approach to earthly existence so that we might look to him who is over the sun, that we might look up. You see, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with wisdom or money or honor or children or long life or eating or simplicity or even the fact that we have desires. But God has programmed these things to be unsatisfying until we are satisfied in Him. This is the point of Ecclesiastes 7.13. Who is able to straighten what God has bent? God has done this on purpose, programmed the created order to be frustrating if we pursue life apart from Him. Listen to Romans 8.20. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it. It's again one of those divine passives. Who's doing the subjection of the created order unto futility? God is. And Romans 8 tells us he does that in hope of something. God did this. God is the one behind the frustrations of life. 
Or we might say it this way, God is the one frustrating godless living. God is the one who frustrates godless living. God himself is the problem here, and God himself is the answer to the problem. That is where Solomon is driving all of us. At the end of his sermon, he says, the conclusion when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments. That's that great Old Testament way to say, be in a right relationship to your maker. And then he goes on to say in verse 14 of chapter 12, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. God wants us to fear Him now, to cling to Him by faith now, to obey Him now, so that when judgment comes, we will not have squandered our entire earthly existence and all the blessings and all the gifts in futility, but will actually worship Him and then enjoy eternity in His presence. In Luke 12, Jesus said this, verses 19 to 21. I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And the hypothetical man Jesus describes has rested with all of his accomplishments, all of his accoutrements, and thought that he'd found the meaning of life. But God said to him, Luke 12, 20, You fool! This very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Jesus himself said when he was on the earth that someone greater than Solomon is here. That someone is Jesus. And the greater than Solomon... The one who said those words in Luke 12 is the one who manifested the glory, the beauty, the goodness, the kindness, the love, and the mercy of God to humanity. You see, while God is the one that is frustrating the created order so that it will not yield satisfaction to godless people, it is our sin, it is our sin that has set this whole world awrong. What Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden, you and I repeat day in and day out. The fundamental problem of humanity is our inherent wickedness, our inherent rebellion against God, our inherent desires to do things our own way, to live life on our own terms, to put a fist in our Maker's face and say, I want to live the way I want to live. Don't tell me what to do. When our gracious Heavenly Father showers gift after gift after kindness after kindness on an earth filled with rebels who continue to shake their fist in His face, they breathe His oxygen in order to spew their venom. They walk His green earth in order to trample His honor. This is the condition all of us were born in. This is the condition all of us pursued and that slavery to rebellion was a slavery that we loved. But it's a slavery that ends in death. And Jesus, the one greater than Solomon, came. And the first time he came, he said, he did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. That is, is, He's the one who is rightfully owner of all things. The one to whom we should all be His servants. And He came to be our servant. To lay down His life in the place of sinners. To actually pay for our crimes to bring us to God. It is Jesus Christ who makes the blessings of this life receivable, enjoyable in this life. So that even in a broken world, you, have, you who have come to God through faith in Jesus Christ, who have had your sins paid for, who have been placed into a right relationship with your maker, you have the ability to enjoy life. In a way the rest of the world can't, will never 
Charles Bridges said, it is the sweet savor of Christ that is the only antidote to the wretchedness of man. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that God's invisible attributes, His eternal power, and His divine nature are clearly seen. So His invisible attributes are clearly seen. How does that work? He says, through creation, through the things that have been made. You see, the created world that God made displays His creativity, His power, His ingenuity, His kindness, His love, His kingship, His godness, His excellencies. And all of those things are seen even more clearly in His Son, the person of Jesus Christ who is the radiance of the Father. He is the exact representation of His being. All the glorious and beautiful and good attributes of God are seen in the person of Jesus Christ, His beloved Son. And think about what that means for our relationship to creation. If we are rightly related to our Creator, if you think that life is to be found in the good, beautiful, wonderful blessings that are available in this life, you're short-sighted. No doubt these things are beautiful and delightful. There, there is much to be praised in the created order. And yet if you set your sights there, you've missed the point that they come from someone. And the infinite, glorious, beautiful mind and the excellency of His character is the one from whom these things come. And God will roll them all up like a garment and dispense with them and create a new heavens and a new earth. And the mind that can do that, the power that can call all of that out of nothing and then sustain it, and the one who can give enjoyment in those things to those who are rightly related to him, is the one who has promised eternal life to all who will come to him through Jesus. And Jesus says, this is eternal life, to know him and the one He has sent. Do you understand the created order is finite and it is a picture of the infinite excellencies of the one who made it. And so if you've ever thought that heaven or eternal life is just going to be the eternal extension of your favorite pastime, <laughs> you've set your gaze too low. You're thinking earthly thoughts. You've missed the point that God, the giver of all good things, is the one who promises infinite goodness to those who are His forever and ever and ever. And all of the infinite power and beauty and glory, we see it in the person of Jesus Christ. Is there anything better than Him? Could you possibly compare earthly fame to getting Jesus? Or all the treasures of the world, would you trade it for Him? Or 2,000 years to live here in a broken world. Or 100 kids. Or Solomon's wisdom. Or would you want any of those things in exchange for having Jesus Christ himself? We sang about him earlier. He is the glorious Christ. The radiance of the Father. Before the dawn of time, he, he spoke... And all creation came to be. He is the glorious Christ, the greatest of all delights. His power unequaled, His love beyond all heights. And of course, there was no greater sacrifice than when He laid down His life. And one day we will join the song of angels. And we will praise our glorious Christ. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, you are enthroned at God's right hand, seated now in heaven, and you, by your death and your resurrection, have shattered death for us. You have freed us from our fears, from our slavery to death, and though we cannot see you, 
we believe you, we love you. We know that you're coming back again. And all will be made right when you appear. You will undo the curse. You will wipe away every tear. You will be our God and we will be your people and we will dwell in your presence in infinitely increasing delight for all of eternity. We long for that day. In the meantime, we sing your praises with these feeble lips and by your power in Jesus' name.